Linda Ordway came to a five-day program in Florida with a troop of other ladies and they practically took over and uh, she came with these brochures saying that this was her uh, Cedar Creek Resort and that God had given her and her husband Greg a vision that they should facilitate the new to use their premises to facilitate the new. They then went on to build a conference center just to host and facilitate programs. And predominantly those are wow. Okay, so they're very committed. Um, they have, uh, uh, from the time we met them, I mean, Linda's gift is just, she is a doer. You, 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 you want to be very slow to speak with her because before you can even think of something, she's already run, uh, well, run thousand meters ahead, preparing the way for that. Okay, so uh, she's been an absolute blessing. Um, she's come a long way as well since we first met since East met West. <laughs> She's come a long way to understand um, the teachings, the revelation, our culture, uh, and she's done an awesome job of that. Um, and I think this trip, I believe, has obviously taken that relationship and that understanding to the next level. So I want you to give the warmest, loudest, wowest welcome to Linda Ordway! <laughs> Okay, I'm the down down, and my husband's the up up, okay? So you all sit down down, because you're gonna get a little bit of Missouri humor. Um, I have found out how much practical joking things goes on around here. Because I heard come out of Kirby's mouth the first time when I was listening to Christian Mystery School with 250 other people that he was taking us up north where there were no potties and no air conditioning. Now, right then I was like, can we vote on this? But in front of 200 people, I had to act like it was going to be okay. But it was not okay. Now, I'm, I'm telling you that I like the conveniences. And so the, when we got there, and Mel says to me, well, we've got this one all set up and it's really clean just for you. And I'm thinking, you don't get up when you're 64 years old off of them squatty potties. <laughs> it doesn't work. So no, I am not okay with that. Now, then I think that's all, you know, it's gonna be okay. And they tell me we're going to a Hindu temple. <laughs> Now, the first thing they said is that the men all have to take their shirts off. <laughs> Even if you're not a Hindu, you have to take your shirt off. And that the women have to wear this little sarong thing. <laughs> now, I believe them. And I'm, they show me, it's only the swide. And they say, you cover the crucial parts and there'll be some of the tummy hanging out. I'm like, my tummy has stretch marks from a 12 pound, six ounce child that it should never see the light of day. So I'm just telling you, I was stressing for four hours as we're driving down the road because I don't want my tummy to show to anybody, but I really want to see this temple. Now, we get there and I'm praying and they say, it's closed. And I was like, thank you God, you rescued me. Then all of a sudden I found out it's not true. None of it was true. And I stressed for four hours and it wasn't just Kirby and Fiona and Mel. The whole bus was convincing me that I had to do this. Now, culture shock and not knowing what's true and what's false 
there is a trust factor here that I need an insider who will be true to me instead of them. But all practical jokes aside, I've had a wonderful time. It's been amazing. So what I've done with my little gift, so you're going to hear his gift, which is the up, up, which I'm telling you is amazing. Yeah. Okay. My gift is the down, down. So do I, do you have my queued up? Okay. So they're, they're going to put some of this together and I'm going to read this and you guys are going to get to see some of what we've done this last week. We have no words to express our appreciation for everything that you all have done. Kirby, Fiona, Mel, all you other wowers, plus drivers and cooks, our thanks to everyone. This is an experience of a lifetime, they say, and it's absolutely true. Figuring out what's practical joke is what can also be credited to many of you. Time with the wow family in person is precious for all. Being able to see the monkeys and elephants was definitely my most intense call. Having my eyes beholding all the people with all the different shades of brown, we're hoping to help some of you in the future be able to see our little Missouri town. <laughs> Kirby, Fiona, Mel, they made a schedule so we could also go see the Northern and Eastern Province ADC churches sites and make some history. It was great to be able to wade in that warm Indian Ocean. That was so divine. There is so much more to experience here. We know this is our first, but not our last time. As we traveled the hours of roads, cows and goats or drying rice were normal occurrence on the road. Then we are seeing monkeys here or there was known to be a real nuisance. What I wanted to believe God for, lots of wild monkeys to see, Others were using loud voices and firecrackers to chase them away from me. Now, seeing elephants in the wild is one of my top Sri Lanka desires. We had traveled for days over miles of hills by rice paddies through muck and mire. We went to the prawn farms on our way to the first healing meeting, but no elephants there to show their faces to give me a greeting. I decided to taste those prawns from a farm pond to table Sri Lankan variety. Only the big surprise that on the plate, they sat with all their eyeballs staring up at me. <laughs> yes, many things are different in Sri Lanka. In other ways, they are quite the same. Levels of destitution and ravages of war are more obvious as well as the power in Jesus' name. Honestly, seeing monkeys and elephants in the wild was my personal highlight. Being from the USA, that's not an ever day-to-day -day possible sight, except for in an encased zoo behind lots of walls, glass, and bars. We would not ever see any of those animals in any of our yards, whether it's a tiny, cute baby monkey or an elephant as big as a truck, I know being able to experience that all within the same hour was not just luck. I had people praying and God intervening as we went to the Eastern Sri Lanka parts when all of a sudden, just before sunset, we had two elephants decide to walk by our cars. <laughs> yeah, it's true, it can still happen, but what everyone from here will say, you usually don't see two elephants on the same road on the same day. But God loves me. He definitely knew that seeing the monkeys and elephants were important to me as much as seeing you. <laughs> they work at growing the East. We're working at growing the West. That's what Kirby believes for all of us would be the best. Our wildlife world team sure has our work to do, but so do they, helping people see Jesus with the difference in culture all along the way. All over the world, to the north, the east, the west, and also to the south, helping them understand what really following Christ is all about. Say no to religion. That's the first for sure. Say yes to relationship is the true cure. 
Knowing your God loves you is a must. Letting him know the level you love him is all about trust. Helping people grow individually all along the way, allowing everyone to be themselves is key for them to choose to stay. You must teach people to be true to themselves as they are so used to being told to copy someone else. Most leaders want to make a congregation full of many, many me's, but not Kirby. In his church, you are encouraged to be the unique and amazingly stay free. No matter what you and God decide, you are celebrated for being on his divine and very unique ride. No need to please man in any specific way. Just be loyal to the cause is acceptance enough with no other pay. You can journey here or there and you will see. No one cares for sure as long as you stay true to being your true me. Um. So now, as we near our time of departure, on to Aussie land we go, <laughs> where seeing a kangaroo and some <laughs> koala bears will be my next show. <laughs> But before we leave your wonderfully colorful land, we want to be sure that we say thank you for all the wonderful experiences that we have had here every single day. Your hospitality, it was so amazing. Your smiles were all so inviting. We have no way of repaying every moment of blessing we have experienced that is so uniting. Thanks to all of you who have blessed us from near or from far. I'm so glad I've met you in person and now know more of you that you truly are. Thank you, Wow family, for making us feel welcome here for sure. Maybe making an annual pilgrimage will need to be what we do now every year. <laughs> we love you. We thank you. We bless you all. You have made the most memorable trip that makes it hard to leave you now. Thanks again for everything from the bottom of our hearts. Your love and acceptance has been amazing, and to that, we will truly never be apart. Aww. Aww. Come on. We can tell Linda loves her words, right? Yeah, she loves her words. She transcripts Kirby's messages. And pages and pages and pages. While he's talking, she just, yeah. And she's also, like, a, she loves words. She, she's a writer. So, wasn't that lovely? Yeah? Is that the first Thanksgiving poem you've received? Yeah? Yeah. Okay, now, before we invite uh, Greg Ordway up, what is the word you're going to use today to pull and to draw on what he's saying? Huh? Well, what are you going to choose? Beyond a doubt? Are you sure? Because <laughs> Greg is like, I don't know. Huh? Amen, amen. <laughs> Have you heard Greg Ordway teaching? It is going to be heavy. It is going to be pregnant. It is going to be full of anointing. Okay? So are you going to say beyond a doubt? Is that what you want? Then choose something quickly. Huh? So be it. Okay, so be it. So be it. All right. So be it. Give the loudest shout. Wow, welcome to Greg Ordway. We truly are grateful to have the opportunity to be here. You know, Linda said it quite well. <laughs> I won't compete with that. <laughs> but thank you, Kirby, Fiona. It's just been an honor to be here. Everybody else has just been wonderful. As we begin, I'd like to just acknowledge not only them, but I always like to acknowledge our Father in Heaven and Yeshua 
and Ruach HaKodesh, because they're always with us, always. And I also like to acknowledge the seven spirits. You know, they aren't just decorations in the throne room. They're actual living presence, a living being. And their whole intent is actually to help us come into a perfect intimacy with Yahweh. And they're really fun to get to know, but that's not what I'm going to talk about tonight. And then I am going to share a little bit about what I call our, our Hebrew living friends. And I acknowledge them, and I always honor them. But most of all right now, I'd just like to acknowledge and honor all of you. Because you are kings. <laughs> you are actually holy, righteous, magnificent, glorious, unlimited, eternal, immortal, ever-living, life-giving, brightly shining, perfect reflections of the light and glory of Yahweh. And you are above anything and everything else, His most beloved Son. Amen. So I just like to greet you with a blessing. Barak Atah Hesed Ben Yehovah, Ani Nasa Yasar, Panaim Yehovah Yeshua Ruach Kadesh, Haya Tamaim Meolam Veyad Olam. Means blessed are you, the beloved sons of Yahweh. And I lift you up into the whirlwind to be in the very face of Yahweh, Yeshua, and Ruach, where you may exist with him in perfection forever. Amen. 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 <clears throat> oh, there's my whiteboard. Okay. <laughs> hmm. So Hebrew... Most people think of Hebrew as the Hebrew language, the language of the Jews. That's what I thought for a long, long time. It's interesting. I went to two Bible schools, and I knew Hebrew was the language of the Old Testament. The New Testament was written first in Aramaic, then went to Greek. But I never really studied Hebrew and all those classes. And you know, like most Bible students, they have a concordance, the Strong's Concordance, I think, is the most well-known one, where you can look a word up and look it up in Hebrew. But I never paid attention to actual, the actual Hebrew. I just read what Strong's said. And then we had some people come to our property, maybe some of you might know her, Nancy Cohen. And she would, in her sharing, would she, she just touch on one of them, Hebrew, just a little bit. And then she brought some other people who would just share a little bit here and there. But it captivated me. And I, and I was curious as to what the Hebrew really was, because what they shared wasn't anything like what I had heard. And so they did tell me that Jehovah's name in Hebrew is, that's how you spell it, yod Hey vav Hey. Now, mind you, at this point, I didn't, I don't, I didn't know anything what I know today. All I knew was that somebody said that. I didn't even know what those meant. That's all they told me. And then they, they said that you can, in, in like a meditation or an engagement with your private time with Yahweh is to use his name as an engagement. 
And so they just did this exercise. And so one morning I decided to do that and I got up early before anybody else. And so I'm standing in my kitchen. And so I just began to do that. And so I just, I just went, yo, Hey, Vav, hey, you just feel that? And I started to do it again. <laughs> but when I went to say Yod, Yod physically manifested in front of me. And hey, and Bob. And I, I just reached out and I just danced with Yod. And then Yod would pass me off to hey. And I danced with Hay, and Hay passed me off to Yo, I mean to Bob. And I'm just in my kitchen, and for 30 or 40 minutes, I'm dancing with these Hebrew friends. And I've just never stopped dancing. <laughs> So then, I, you know, you have an encounter like that and, and you just realize, you know, that they're actual living beings. It's not just a language. They're not just letters. And in Genesis 1, it gives us a clue as to why. And he, in English, Genesis 1 says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In Hebrew, it's Bereshit, bara et Elohim. Ve'et ha-shamayim, ve'et ha'aretz. The only difference between the two is in Hebrew, they don't um, translate the word et, which is Aleph Tav. The Aleph Tav is a, like um, an encompassing name for all of the Hebrew living, all the Hebrew lovers, Aleph Tav. Aleph is the first one, Tav is the last one. And so what Genesis 1 really says is that in the beginning, Yahweh created the Aleph Tav. And out of the Aleph Tav, he created the heavens and the earth. It's a little different. <laughs> Just as in this realm, we know everything's made of atoms, right? Well, every atom is made out of the Aleph Tav. <laughs> You, you can't do anything in this realm without engaging them. For example, when you eat on a round plate, this is our Hebrew friend, Samek. He has the shape of the plate. Your knife is our Hebrew friend, Bav. A fork is a Hebrew friend Vav with a shin on top. A spoon is a Vav with a pay on top. I'm just saying it's in everything. It's, it's everywhere. And they are um, just for example, the first one is Aleph. Aleph is, um, has the number one, but it also has a picture of an ox head. So each one of them have a letter form, a number form, a letter, uh, picture form, 
and they each all have a sound. So that's why I call them my Hebrew living friends, because if I just said that they were Hebrew living letters, all you, all you would think about is that, and you wouldn't understand them, the rest of it. There's a lot of times they show up in number form in all of your lives every day, and you just don't know it. <laughs> Uh, g give me a five five digit number. What? <laughs> Say that again. Seventy five thousand. Oh, that's going to be fun. See, when we see a number like that, we say, well, that'd be nice to have on my bank account, right? <laughs> Amen. <laughs> but what he just said was to behold the fullness of Yahweh's breath and be entangled in him in an intimate oneness so that he could breathe his pleasure. So when you get to learn who, the, who they are, then they're talking to you all the time. Now the purpose of the Aleph Tav is to help you know Yahweh. I was... I was having a conversation with them because, I mean, they, you know, I see them all the time. And one day I was just having a conversation with them. And I'm like, this is going to be so fun to work with you. We're going to have so much fun doing things for the kingdom. And I was talking along those lines. And all of a sudden, I mean, they just all went quiet. And I'm like, what did I just say? Because I thought I was saying it was okay. And then one of them stepped out and said, well, we, we can do that, but we would really much rather help you learn how to love Yahweh with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. <laughs> so they really, really are more about helping you know him. Because Yahweh is infinite. Now, if he showed up in all of his infiniteness right now, that just might be a little overwhelming. So he created these Hebrew living friends to help us be able to understand and engage with him in different ways. I don't have time tonight to go through all of them. <clears throat> we will be here till tomorrow morning. But I will say that I just did a class and then you can go to my website. I don't know if we can post that or not, but it's, um, it's just behold. 365.com and you can go on there the class is on there it's free and I just go through one by one and I just show the basics in November I'm going to do another class which will go into a whole other layer because they're just multi-dimensional in how they function and how they work so let me show you like there's one word in Hebrew that probably most of you have all heard. What do you all mostly think when you think of that, see that word? Peace. Shalom in Hebrew. It's a shin, a lamed, a vav. Oh, and amen. I get drunk sometimes, so. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so if you see me wobble a little bit, you just know I'm just having a nice drink. So <clears throat> just. So what does shalom mean then? What does Hebrew tell us shalom means? It means to be consumed with going up into the heart of Yahweh where you're com completely connected 
with his hidden mysteries and his pleasure. So when someone says shalom to you, it's not really, I mean, peace is a byproduct of that. But when you say shalom, you're telling and encouraging people to be consumed with going up into the heart of Yahweh in the eternal above realm where you're completely connected with his hidden mysteries and his pleasure. Yeah. Yes, yes. Shalom. <laughs> so I found out real quick that my English Bible just wasn't entirely accurate. And so I, I put myself in school, and I'm not telling you to do what I did. I'm just telling you what I did. Because after my engagement with them and seeing them, I would take a piece of paper, like a notepad paper, and I found, I found me a little cheat sheet, and it, and it would have the name and a picture, you know, all, all, the, all those things, and I would write them out, all of them, all 22 of them out, and I would do it 10 to 15 times a day. And I did day after day, week after week, month after month. Because I'm like, well, if I'm going to know them, I at least need to know which face goes with which name? I mean, that's just my thinking. Yeah. You know, just like I know Fiona and I know what she looks like, you know, so I don't call her Fiona because that's, <clears throat> right? So that's where I started. And since then, I've just been taken into, I just put it this way, how much treasure do you want today? Because it's, it's rather extensive and unending. Uh, do I have a time limit? <laughs> about one hour? All right, well, somebody tell me when it's about 10 minutes. So I can kind of wrap it up. <clears throat> yod Hey vav Hey Yehovah. Now, in, in Yahweh's or Yehovah's infinite wisdom, He chose those four to be in His name. You know, there's 22 of them, so He He picked those four to be in His name. And Jeremiah tells us that Yehovah, that is my name forever. So what is, what is he saying to us? Yod here is actually the smallest of all of them, but it actually represents the infinite energy of Yahweh. And when I say the infinite energy of Yahweh, I'm talking about an energy that does not exist in this realm. It's, it comes from the uh, eternal above realm. It's a different quality of energy. It's a higher quality of energy. It has, a, it has a higher frequency, a higher dimension to it than the energy that's in this realm. But it's also an energy that can create anything, anywhere, at any time, in any place, in any realm, in any dimension. He's so good. <laughs> so we have, I'm just going to use the word infinite. Hey means breath. One of, one of the definitions means breath. Vav means to connect. Hey means breath. So basically it's telling us that Yahweh's infinite breath wants to connect with your breath. <clears throat> Yahweh is so consumed with being one with you. I mean, he is consumed with being one with you. Now, 
Yeshua said this in John 17. He said, I pray that you would be one as we. I really don't know exactly what one as we is. I just say yes and amen. That's for me. I'm in. <laughs> and you can take me into that oneness that's one as we. Because I know it's more than anything anybody in this room knows what one as we is. It's deeper. It's more profound. It's more intimate. It's, it's more delicious. He is so good. Another thing, now see, here's the thing about Hebrew. In the Western, you know, we read from left to right. This side of the world, you read from this way, right? So in another time, I was having a time with my Hebrew friends, and, and they just spoke to me, and they said, now you have to understand, your rules of reading and writing don't apply to us. I'm like, well, what do you mean? They said, you, you can read from right to left or left to right. You can read from inside out or from outside in. Now, I could take the rest of the hour just on his name. But I want to share something very specific, so I'm not going to do that. But if you read this backwards, this says to behold the Son, to behold the Father. Mm -hmm. Isn't that cool? <laughs> now, Yahweh designed his name that when you engage his name and you in your own meditation and you can make up your own song and you're just going, Yod, Hey, Vav, Hey. Everything that's in his name is being resonated within you. Amen. Right. Everything. In Genesis 1, when it says, In the beginning Yahweh created the heavens and the earth, he is saying that it has always been his full intent that we would engage in both heaven and earth. There was never supposed to be a separation between heaven and earth. See, we've lived under a false structure and a false mindset that says you're an earthling and you're in the earth until you die and then you get to go to heaven. And when you're here, all you are is a requisition officer. Because all you do is go around and you see a problem and you fill out your little form and you give it to your angel and the angel takes it up into heaven and it says, <clears throat> you are not a requisition officer. That was not your intent. That is not your design. You are supposed to be a co-creator with Yahweh. You are supposed to walk with him like Adam walked with him, like Enoch walked with him, like Adam. I, Abraham walked with him. <laughs> you and him are supposed to walk in this oneness where you are pulling heaven and manifesting it on the earth and you're doing it together, co-creating together. <laughs> See, we, for, we, we have so not thought of ourselves as highly as we ought. Everything I said about you when I first started is absolutely true. Yeah. Right now. Yeah. Right. You are not an earthling. You didn't you were not created out of the earth. You came out of Yahweh. You came out of an eternal, limitless, eternal, inferno flaming being. And he gave you a body. And your body is not a throwaway. Huh. And while we're at it, death is optional. That's right. Right? 
I never have understood why people didn't pick up on this. But just to give you three examples, yeehaw, <laughs> exclamation point. <laughs> we all know Enoch, right? Enoch walked with Yahweh and he was not. And we'll talk about him later in a little bit. Then there's Elisha. The fiery chariot came and got him and took him up. And then Yeshua himself is the third example. Now he, now get me, he did come, he did die. He did rise from the dead. I fully believe that. I've said this to people before and, they, and they're saying, well, you're, you're saying he didn't die. I'm like, no, I believe he died. <laughs> I believe he rose from the dead. Then, was it 40 days later, he gets all his disciples together. He's out in the countryside and he's talking to them. And you notice he didn't have to die to go to heaven. So why do you have to? What? I mean, if you don't go to heaven, go to heaven. You just don't have to die to do it. You just go. <laughs> or you don't want to die, you could just live forever. <laughs> you know, we need to get to a point where we don't just try to do what our fathers did. Now, I really appreciate, you know, the past movements. I, I truly do honor them. But like, you know, we just had a healing service where, you know, we're laying hands on people and people are getting healed and delivered and devils are being cast out. And I say yes and amen to that. I'm not saying to stop. But I am saying... <clears throat> You know, we can think bigger. In Job, it says, <sighs> just another drink. Rudafesh <laughs> uh, is the Hebrew word. It says, you will be rejuvenated and you will return to the days of your youth. So do you realize that while we're sitting in this meeting right now, that you are engaging with Yahweh himself, that eternal creative life energy is coursing through your being. And there are going to be people in this building that are going to leave younger than when they came. All right? I mean, why should we just stop at healing? I mean, we have the promise <laughs> that your youth can be restored. Your vitality can be restored. There'll be some of you that'll notice it tomorrow. There'll be some of you notice it a week from now. Right? I'm just saying, we have an infinite God. We can do infinite things. Okay. Yep, that's it. His flesh shall be young like a child's, and he shall return to the days of his youth. Okay. Let me get to what I want to share with you about Yahweh. In Hebrew, this is 10. That's 5. This is 6. That's 5. If you add all of those up, you get to 26. 26 in Hebrew is a, um, 20 is Kof, and six is Vav, which I already said that. So what is Yahweh? <laughs> Kof. Oh, mm -hmm. it's so good. <laughs> <laughs> represents 
the highest realm that in Hebraic thought, the crown. Now in the crown, in Hebrew, there are two dimensions. The lower one, if you want to call it that, is delight. The highest one is pleasure. Vav, in simple form, is mean to connect. In, in, in a more fuller sense, it actually means the most complete, highest, widest, and deepest connection. So when you say Yehovah, Yehovah is revealing to us that he is the highest and the deepest and the widest and the most complete pleasure there is. He is a being of pleasure. When you engage him, you're engaging pure pleasure. And when I began to see that from my Hebrew friends, as they began to reveal that to me, I could feel religious constructs begin to just disintegrate. Religious structures to break down because he is pure pleasure. And as I engage the reality that he is a being of pleasure, He's not sitting on a throne waiting to throw a lightning bolt at me. He's not the judge that's sitting there and as soon as you do something wrong, he throws the book at you. His whole intent and design is to encompass you and infuse you with his pleasure. You know, there's a lot of people that don't know that. They don't know him as pleasure. But he is. And that's what his name tells us. It means pleasure. But it also means, if you read it this way, he's telling us and inviting us and encouraging us, be completely in the highest, widest, deepest way you can connected to my pleasure. He wants you to engage with him in pleasure. Uh, I'll see if I can sneak this in. So if you, that's Jehovah's name. If you take Yeshua's name, you add a shin. yod Hey shin bab Hey. Yeshua. <coughs> If you do that, this becomes that. 326. So what is Yeshua? Yeshua. Well, Shin means the fire. It's a burning, consuming fire. It's a perpetual fire. So Yeshua is actually completely consumed with Yahweh, Yehovah. I mean, he is absolutely, positively, ragingly, ravishingly consumed with his father. Absolutely consumed. He's consumed with the pleasure of being connected to Yahweh. See, Yahweh doesn't want us just to know facts about him. He wants us to have a full-on, complete, indulgent engagement with him. John, my friend John, he tried to tell us in 1 John chapter 1, the things which I've seen the things which I've heard, the things which I've looked upon, <laughs> and the things which I have handled. He's talking about an immersive 
engagement, experience with Yahweh. He's actually hearing. He's actually feeling. He's actually seeing. He's actually taking the time. That word look upon, it means to actually give yourself into something. And John's telling us he's doing that. Now, if you read down a few verses, John makes this statement that nobody in any of the churches I ever grew up in would ever stand up and make. He says, truly, my fellowship, my union, that word, that word he used fellowship actually has a, has a meaning of intercourse, intimacy. He says, my fellowship is with the Father and with the Son. There's a lot of people who say, I believe in him. There's a lot of people <clears throat> that say they love him. But John went someplace a lot of people never went. Remember, he was the one who was laying his head on Yeshua's heart. Yeshua and Yehovah have the most intense relationship you could ever imagine. And one day when I was spending time with them, I was taken up into the heavenly realm and I was suspended in between Yahweh and Yeshua and Ruach. And I was in the midst of the greatest lightning storm you could ever imagine. Because they don't... Move back over here. <laughs> They don't use words. <laughs> words are inadequate for them. <laughs> Their communication was like lightning bolts. And I'm standing or suspended in the midst of this, and I'm seeing all of these lightning bolts flash between all three of them in all directions. And as I'm in the midst of this, I see one of these lightning bolts come out of Yahweh's going to Yeshua. And for whatever reason, Yahweh was just really gracious to me. And this lightning bolt just like creeped by me. I just like watching this lightning bolt go by me in slow motion. <clears throat> and as it did that, I could, I, I put it this way, I could understand the table of contents. <laughs> because there's probably more information in that one lightning bolt than exists in the entire earth. But the table of contents, let's say there were, let's say there were 12 chapters. Nine of those chapters, well, let me put it the other way. Only one of those chapters, only one of them, had to do with them running the universe and running everything and keeping track of the 7 billion people on the earth and where they all are at in their relationship with him, which is, that would be quite a, I'd like to see somebody put that on a spreadsheet. <laughs> what to do with all the angels, making sure all their assignments are done. Only one chapter was dedicated to that. The other 11 chapters were all about how much they loved each other. Now, my friend John helped me out with this because he had come to me. I mean, you know that verse in 1 John 3, 1? John exclaiming, behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us. Well, that, that really gripped me. For nine months, I lived on that verse. Because it's like I knew there was more than what I knew. And I couldn't get away from it. And so I cried out and I'm like, John, what did you see? So 
So one day we were on vacation. I'm sitting by the pool and I'm just reading my Hebrew Bible. And all of a sudden in front of me, it's, it's just like a door opened up. And like these white beings, six of them came walking towards me and, they, and there were two rows of them, three on each side. They stepped to the side and there's John. Now, if you ever see John, John is one of those people that carries so much weight just in his presence. I mean, he, he would just stand in the room and everybody would know it. I mean, he, he carries so much weight. But he came to me and he put it to me this way. He says, when I said that, this is what I was trying to let you know. Because he says it's about the kind of love. It's not, it's, it, you can't stop at the Lord loves you. I'm not saying that's not a true statement. But that's not an engagement. That's a statement of fact. John's saying you have to go to engagement, engagement. And so this is how he described it to me. He said, there is a raging, ravishing, exploding, erupting, passionate, intimate, never ending, unbound, untamed, unrestrained love. And that's rocked my world because <laughs> that's engagement that you can get to a point where you say Yahweh ravish me with your love and then when I was in the midst of that lightning storm the intensity of that kind of love is going between them. It, it was so intense. It was so passionate. It was so intimate. I'm blushing. No one ever told me that they would love like that. But that's the divine dance he's wanting you to dance in. <laughs> he wants you to dance in that kind of raging, ravishing, exploding, erupting, unbound, untamed, unrestrained. And then Yeshua added one more word. <laughs> Unashamed. They are so completely unashamed of their love for one another and their love for you. They could care less what anybody in here or anybody around the world thinks. <laughs> they don't care. They don't care what any of the angels say. They love each other like that in front of all of heaven. And all he's looking for is somebody who will reflect that back to him. Right. It's out of that kind of a relationship that you can create. Right. Yeshua, he has that kind of passionate relationship with Yahweh. So now I want to talk to you about where you came from. You know, this country is amazing. The people are even more amazing. <laughs> you, you have a history here we don't have in America. <laughs> but you have roots that go deeper than that. Because when Yahweh made us, Whoa. I'm so drunk, I draw it backwards. 
if I do it right this time. I got that way. Okay, I am Dalit. Man. Adam. When Yahweh created Adam, Adam, this is what he created. Ayin. It, it, it's an eye. It actually means to see. Dalit um, is a doorway. It means a door. It also means to lift up. And then this mem, there's actually two mems. This is what this closed, the closed mem. This mem represents the, the hidden mysteries of Yahweh. It represents Eden. It represents his pleasure. Adam was created to a being who could see and be lifted up into the pleasure of Yahweh. So we have Yahweh, a being of pure pleasure, who created Adam, a being that can see and go through the door and engage with Eden, engage in the hidden mysteries, engage in the living waters that are above. See, you were created to engage with him. And <clears throat> separation is an illusion. And I'll show you why it's an illusion. <laughs> so Adam was a being of pleasure. He's created to engage in pleasure with Yahweh. That's what you're designed to do. That's how you will function in your highest. Pleasure is the highest realm to, to engage with Yahweh. <laughs> Now we know the story of Adam. Now this is what was this is what the kind of life Adam lived before his bad day. Genesis 2:25 it's the last verse that's recorded of Adam and Eve before their bad day. And it says they were both naked and unashamed. We've scandalized being naked. But Adam and Eve lived with Yahweh, Yeshua, and Ruach. They were all living in a place where they were naked and unashamed with each other. And they loved each other with everything that they had. And they honored each other with everything that they had. And they had so much appreciation and adoration for each other. And they were completely naked and unashamed of doing so. And Yahweh saying... You too. Now, we all know I'm not talking about physical nakedness. But I am just going to use an example. How many of you have ever gone into the shower and prayed or worshipped or had a conversation with Yahweh? And you didn't even think twice the fact that you were completely naked while you were doing it. Hmm. All right? We shouldn't be ashamed of being naked with Yahweh. <laughs> but the word naked is... Um, that might not show up too good. Let me get the red one. Uh, Aram. Now, if you want just Yahweh's humor, <laughs> this is the word naked. Unashamed is... Um, low bush. So I just find it humorous that Yahweh would do that because before his bad day, there was no bush. After his bad day, they went and found a bush. <laughs> That's just humorous. It means way more than that. A rom, 
Oh, let's see what is wrong. Is um, Ayan Resh Vav Men. So to be naked means to see into the highest places and be completely in the highest, widest, deepest way engaged with pleasure. That's what naked means. That's before his bad day. I'm not going to get into that. After his bad day, in English... In chapter 3 of Genesis, he, Yahweh comes to Adam. And let me just say this about that. See, religion teaches us sin is so bad and so ugly that it makes you smell so bad. Yahweh can't be around you. He can't touch you. He can't do anything with you because you're in sin. Well, if it's, that's really true, then how come the Bible says Yahweh was the first person to show up after he sinned? I'm not saying sin's not bad. I'm just saying it's, it doesn't hold a candlestick to him. It doesn't bother him nearly as much as it bothers us. But in Hebrew, I mean, in, in English... It says naked. I mean, he came to him and he says, I was naked and afraid. But when he said naked, it's spelled this way. The difference between the two is there's time it's a yod and not a vav. So what, I have 10 minutes? Oh, this will be fun to land in 10 minutes. <laughs> So what he's saying, the difference is, this is the shift. Yahweh did not shift. Yahweh is there. There's not a shred of condemnation coming from Yahweh to Adam. He just asks him, Adam, where are you? And he says, I'm, I'm naked and afraid. And so basically Adam had shifted from here to here. What that means is instead of seeing <clears throat> Adam seeing himself as being connected to pleasure, He's saying that the only person that can go up into the high places and connect to pleasure now is Yahweh. Adam shifted. Adam quit seeing himself as being able to go up into the high places and connect to pleasure. He couldn't be naked anymore. He says Yahweh is the only one that can be naked. So now listen to Yahweh's response. Adam, who told you that? I didn't tell you that. Who told you that? I didn't separate you from be still being connected to my pleasure. Who told you you couldn't do that anymore? It wasn't me. I didn't tell you that. I didn't separate you from that. I didn't do that. Separation's an illusion. Ten minutes. Okay. <laughs> Genesis 2. Yahweh created Adam. He created a being of pleasure. Where did he put Adam? In Eden. Eden is the actual Hebrew word for pleasure. He created a being of pleasure to fully engage with him in the highest, most intimate, passionate way you could imagine with Yahweh, who is pure pleasure. Put him in an atmosphere and in a climate and in a um, habitat of pleasure. And it says that there's a river flowing through Eden that, that, and it watered the garden. And then it split into four rivers and watered creation. Water, we know today, will carry frequency. 
whatever frequency is around water, it, it goes into the water molecules. So the water that's flowing through Eden is picking up nothing but the frequency and energy of pleasure. Pleasure is what watered the garden. Pleasure is what watered the earth and caused it to flourish. And then Yahweh said, Adam, guard the garden. He's not talking about pruning plants. He's telling him, you guard this pleasure. Don't let anything separate you from this pleasure. Do not let your guard down from taking anything away from allowing this pleasure between you and me and flowing into the earth. John in Revelations 4, why is this important? <laughs> this is important. John tells us in Revelations 4, 11, that everything was and is created for Yahweh's pleasure. Everything. If you're going to function as a son of Yahweh, Paul told us what? Did he tell us? The earth is crying out and groaning for the manifestations of the sons of God. Adam, in I forget which gospel it is, it gives its genealogy. And the last thing it says of him is that he was the son of God. The son of God is the person who knows they are a being of pleasure and they have been given the pleasure of Yahweh to steward in the earth. And all of creation is looking for all of us to come into the place where we are the once again, the people who are the doorways to release the waters of the living waters of pleasure into the earth because it's pleasure that will cause it to come into its fullness and its perfection. Hmm. Enoch. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 5. The testimony of Enoch was what? He lived in the pleasure of Yahweh. He was so caught up and engaged and knew how to drink and eat and sleep and live <clears throat> in the pleasure of Yahweh, he did not even see death. That's right. That's right. Now, if you read the time he was living in was the time where the thoughts of men were continually getting evil until it was full. So it wasn't he was living in a picture-perfect world. But in the midst of that, he so lived in the pleasure of Yahweh, he did not see death. You are extremely blessed to have Kirby. Because he's teaching you how to access heaven and how to drink and eat the pleasure of Yahweh until it comes out of you. Our Hebrew living friends, Aleph Tov, Aleph is the first, Tov is the 22nd. If you add those together, you get 23. <laughs> so what they're really here to help us do is come into intimate pleasure. And it also is about Psalms 23. <laughs> that you get to the point where you, <laughs> he makes you 
to lie down in green pastures. He leads you beside the still waters. He restores your soul. And then get this part. He causes your cup to run over. When Yahweh is pouring out, he just doesn't pour till the cup's full. He keeps pouring till it pours out and it spills onto the tabletop. And he keeps pouring until it starts flooding over onto the floor. And then he keeps pouring out until it runs and, and, and covers the entire area of your thing. And I am telling you that Yahweh wants this island to be a place of his pleasure. Amen. He wants you all to learn how to engage in being his pleasure. And that goes both ways. You learn that he is your pleasure. And as that as he continues to pour out his pleasure on you, it's going to flow out onto you and it's going to flow out all over and cover this floor and it's going to flow down the steps and it's going to flow down into the streets and it's going to keep flowing and flowing until every street is covered and every man and every woman and every child has been touched by the living pleasure of Yahweh. Amen. Well, let me, um, let me close with another blessing. <laughs> this is the priestly blessing. And it's all about helping you to engage in intimate pleasure. Ye vare kreka yod he vav he ve yish mereka. Ye er yod he vav he panav eleka vi hu neka. Yisa yod he vav he panav eleka. Ve yasem laka shalom. Amen. <laughs>